in our ARKG fund and in the top 10 in our ARKK fund uh, has developed a therapy uh, to cure sickle cell disease with, and beta thalassemia, both of those are blood-related diseases, with one treatment. Think about that. Now, the preconditioning for that is gruesome. It's, it's, it involves, it's almost like chemotherapy, which is going to change. Uh, but nonetheless, there's huge demand for it because, you know, these people go to the emergency room 10 to 20 times per year for blood transfusions to save their lives. Mm -hmm. Of course, they're going to go through a tough regimen. They want to live a more normal life. Uh, so it's already generating revenue. Both, both of those are already generating revenue for CRISPR Therapeutics and a company called Vertex. So there's, there's, well, there's three or four different companies you've mentioned here. Tesla, the other one was Archer. Archer is the eVTOL company, yes. Which is your flying cars, basically your drone cars. Yeah. <laughs> and CRISPR and Tesla. So if I start with Tesla, you were bullish on Tesla. You were making big predictions about Tesla before pretty much anyone else out there. I think in 2015. Mm -hmm. And at the time in 2015, you said that you believed the stock would get above 4,000 roughly. Right, on the old stock. Yeah, on the before the stock split. Yes. And you were right by some significant margin. Um I think you predicted it would be 4,000 before the stock stock splits. And I think at its peak, that equates to about 18,000, maybe 12,000 at its peak. Yes. Well, in that region. We, we, we were right about two early years, or Tesla got to where we believed it would go two years before most expected. You know, in 2018 and 19, Many people, as Elon was dis discussing and describing production hell for the Model mm -hmm. 3, um, many people thought the company would go bankrupt. And, uh, and yet we knew that if Elon Musk could create a reusable rocket that could land on a barge in the water, he would be able to figure out how to produce at scale, the Model 3. That was, to us, a simple um, conclusion. Now, as in hindsight, as we're learning from Tesla, production hell, and they themselves were worried. That's why Elon slept on the floor in the production factory and just became maniacally involved, which is how he works. Uh, as uh, So, yes, and now our prediction, the stock is... I'm not going to be exactly right on this, $270, $280. Our prediction in five years is $2,600. And 90% of that valuation comes not from the electric vehicle, but from this robo-taxi platform. Uh, because the electric car, if you think about it, is you know, a one-shot sale, you know, sell and hope they come back when they're replacing their car. This essentially means that we'll be driving cars that we can click a button and then it becomes an autonomous taxi. So I go on holiday, I have my, my Tesla car at my house. When I go on holiday, the car turns into a taxi and starts chauffeuring people around. It makes me money. But also from the consumer's perspective that are trying to hail a taxi, at any point I can go on my Tesla app, press a button, a autonomous car comes to me with no one driving it and it takes me to my destination with no driver at all. Right. Um, and then the recurring revenue model, I believe, is you, subs you subscribe. It, it probably could, it, it, to the it could be a, sub you could subscribe to the network or they could, uh, you know, maybe it could be either or subscription mm -hmm. or a la carte if you don't think you're going to use it that much. So now when I'm here in the UK and Europe, many people do not believe what, what you just said. And, and they don't because your regulators have not allowed FSD here. I think they might, I, I, somewhere in Europe, I think they're beginning to consider it. Maybe even in the UK here, they ha are considering it. Um, in St. Petersburg, Florida, where we're based, um, I can go from my house to anywhere and flawlessly, the car will take me there. Now, we still have to sit in the driver's seat for now, but in June uh, or soon thereafter, when they turn the system on 
if regulators permit. Right now, we're state by state. I think that's going to change so that we'll have federal regulation so that this can happen a lot faster. One other thing about Tesla, though, in that $2,600 number, we do not include much for humanoid robots. Now, I, this and, and this is happening faster than we thought. Um, and the reason it's happening faster is humanoid robots they are the convergence of the same three technologies or innovation platforms as robotaxis, Ro robots, robotics, mm -hmm. so actuators and so forth, getting them to work, energy storage, battery operated, and AI. Mm -hmm. So Tesla's way ahead of the game on humanoid robots, and yet we have very little. Now, Elon thinks that the humanoid robot business is going to dwarf the robo-taxi business. And we think he's right, uh, but longer term. So as I mentioned, we expect all in around the world, including China, not just Tesla, but the entire ecosystem, an eight to uh, $10 trillion market uh, in the next five to 10 years. For humanoid robots, uh, we expect a $26 trillion revenue market. Now, that's going to be a little further along. Uh, Robotaxis will happen faster, but it may not be as distant as we were once thinking. For anyone that doesn't know, humanoid robots are basically robots that we'll have in our home and at work. Mm -hmm. So these are, there was a video that I think um, Elon retweeted the other day showing one of the human, humanoid robots dancing. Dancing, yes. It was that real? I was like looking at that video thinking, surely that's not real. But he confirmed, I believe, that it was real. Yes, yes. Now, when we went to the Cyber Cab event, uh, there were some humanoid robots dancing there, but they were tethered and they were remotely controlled. Yeah. Uh, now, Cyber Cab, I think, was... Uh, About a year ago. Yes, yeah. maybe. So since then, they've been able to untether them. And uh, I do believe that those, that dancing robot was... was um, not tethered and not remotely controlled. It was quite shocking to see a robot doing that because if a robot can have that dexterity and mobility, and then you overlay that with the AI technologies that are accelerating rapidly, it begs the question. And the question is quite clear, which is, what about humans? Yes. Um, and just to put a finer t you know, note on this, um, Elon will not be satisfied until these robots can thread a needle. Mm -hmm. So that's where we're going. What does that mean for humans? So, you know, the history of technology is that it has been a net job creator throughout history. But humanoid robots are getting awfully close to what we do, right? So mm -hmm. it's a good question. I, I think creativity is a big part of that ingenuity and creativity, and you know I think there's going to be a, there are going to be a lot of new inventions uh, in the future. So let's see what those are. But even today, there's something called vibe coding. Have yeah. you heard of it? Okay, because we've moved into the world of natural language programming. What is vibe coding for someone that doesn't know? It's vibe coding means. You know a natural language. I know we all know a natural language. Ours is English for the most part, but it could be any language. Um, we're going to be able to go to ChatGPT, or to, especially now they just launched. I think last week something Codex. called Codex, Replit, uh, and Anthropics, fantastic for for um, programming. And we'll say, this is what I'm attempting to do in English language. And, and I've seen demos of this just internally. We, we're going to replace some of our software that we're buying from outsiders and customize it for us because, you know, we don't have to buy off the shelf anymore. One size fits all. I think there's going to be a lot more customization and personalization and creativity explosion here. You know, it's interesting that this is happening when the demographic profile of the developed world is as it is. Uh, we have a very low unemployment rate in the U.S. I know the unemployment rates in Europe and the U.K. have been dropping to much lower levels than 
where, where they were stuck for years. I remember thinking, wow, double digits. Uh, we have a demographic issue. I mean, if you, if you watch what uh, Elon Musk worries about the most, he, he worries about the population implosion. Uh, because collapse. Uh, collapse collapse in population in the developed world um, because we're not uh, uh, we're not producing children above the fertility rate where we are setting up for a shrinkage with China is going there Japan is going there and so we're going to need productivity uh, uh, productivity to help us if we can't find human beings uh, okay, so you're so you're saying that the ro robotics and AI could actually fill the gap that we lose in terms of productivity because our society is going to be like an inverted pyramid. It's going to be m more um, elderly people and less young people. Yes, yes. So the robots are going <laughs> to. Yes, absolutely. It's, productivity is going to be essential. So as we're looking at real growth ahead, and w w when you think about real growth. Uh, you should be thinking, okay, somebody's benefiting from this. Um, and I'm going to set what I, I'm going to set up the number here uh, by describing what has happened historically. If you look from 1500 to 1900 and you try and figure out what real GDP growth was back then, real economic growth, um, as best as uh, Brett Winton, our chief futurist, in consultation with academics, can determine. It was roughly 0.6% per year. And then we had the Industrial Revolution. Uh, we had the internal combustion engine, telephone, electricity. And for the past 125 years, real GDP growth has been 3%. And and most li living standards have gone up over time. Some more than others, I know that's a debate, but most have gone up. If we, as we look forward, based on the five innovation platforms around which we have centered our research and investing, if we're right, real GDP growth in the next five years could accelerate to 7.3%. And that gives you a sense of uh, the economic ac uh, activity, wealth generation out there. And what, when we are presenting to investors, we are actually presenting to them not only because they're investors, but because they have children or grandchildren who need to adapt to this new world. And our mantra in giving away our research, which we do, is get on the right side of change. We also do podcasts. Um, we, we try, we do a lot of outreach because we think this is a very important moment in time. Uh, seize the moment, grab hold of these new technologies because that growth rate is more than twice where we've been. And if you are on the right side of change, we think the opportunities are going to be enormous, uh, investment opportunities and job opportunities. Yeah, I, I feel like I've, I feel like, um, I feel like I can't figure out what, how the displacement rate m meets the creation rate. So the destruction rate of of current jobs will meet the creation rate of new jobs because many of these new jobs. I guess there's some of them we can't predict yet. I understand that. But even the ones that we can't predict yet would need to be inherently human, i.e. need the skills of a human for them to be occupied by by humans. Um, so what category of stuff is that? Like my, my girlfriend's a breathwork practitioner. She's upstairs now with 10 women and she's teaching them breathwork. Okay. So she's fine. Yeah. Like, because they're doing that in person, whatever. She's fine. Well, and the, maybe she's not if people decide to do that, it on ChatGPT. Yeah, on ChatGPT. But <laughs> but if they want to be with a group of women, yeah, and you know, learn from an expert whom they respect, there's as much the social experience that's going to become more important. Relationships are going to become more important. Many people in our business, I think, are going to be out of jobs because. Uh, the business has become really nothing 
I, I shouldn't be this disrespectful, and it's not, not quite right, but uh, at all. Uh, but you know, so many are just hugging benchmarks, uh, whether it's S and P five hundred or MSCI World or the Nasdaq. That a machine can do that. A machine can do that easily, and that is what passive investing is: is machines doing it. I think in order to earn a place in the new world, you've got to add a lot of value, more value than a machine can. So in our case, we're saying, okay, well, our stocks are not in those benchmarks, uh, and therefore, you know, they're, they're, we are doing original research, trying to figure out who they are and where they are, these, these companies.